Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading True Let's Not Meet Stories. But before we get into that, I do want to mention a couple of things. The first thing that I want to mention is that we do have merch available on our website. The link for the merch will be in the description down below. If you look on the screen right now, you can actually see some of the merch popping up. If you like it, make sure you go and pick some up. It truly does help out the channel. Also, I am going to be uploading videos to Rumble as well. They will be the same videos on this channel. Currently, I am in the process of syncing Rumble with my YouTube channel, so all of my backlog will go over there as well. So if you're a Rumble user, make sure you go check out the channel over there as well. The link for that will also be in the description down below. But for now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. This happened years ago when I was barely 14. My middle school and middle school of my best friend at the time organized a trip abroad to Great Britain, London to be exact. It was supposed to be a few days looking at London attractions, museums, and shops. It was fun. Until it wasn't. For the day before we were supposed to leave and go home, we were brought to the streets with some interesting shops. From there we could see Golden Freddy, and we received free time for shopping. And then our teachers and guide had a brilliant idea. They told us after the time for shopping ends, we have to meet at different streets than this. In retrospect, it was like 100 meters away. But they still should do that. Most of us never been in London. We were barely speaking English. We didn't have a map of the city. Roaming services don't work correctly. 90% of the students got lost. I got lost with my best friend because we went in the complete opposite direction. We were both confused about the directions that we were given. We were walking along pavement. My friend was running ahead or staying behind to nervously look around. We didn't look like we were together because we were not interacting with each other. I guess that's why this happened. My friend ran ahead and stopped to look around. When I saw a black car approach me and match my speed, I started to feel like this was a scene from a movie. It was broad daylight. There were a lot of people around and no one reacted. I was confused and didn't know what was happening. Then, from the car stepped a man, and he said, You're nice. Come with me. And then he tried to grab me. The car was still running, so I supposed that someone was still in it. I was stunned. I did not believe that what was happening was real. At that moment, my friend ran to me from behind, grabbed me and dragged me away. We ran and tried to lose the man or the car that was following us. After some time, we stopped and my friend nervously cried, shaking me and screaming. Why didn't I move when the man tried to catch me? I explained my deer in headlights moment. We cooled down and managed to ask some people for help and we were found by our teachers. We didn't tell anyone what happened we were sure that no one would believe us. After that, when we got back, I told my parents, and I never went on a trip organized by my school again. My mom considered all of that really unprofessional and irresponsible. This story kind of creeped me out. It happened about nine years ago and sometimes comes to my mind. And still to this day, it creeps me out. So I was on an adult dating site, one of the fetish types. I know, don't judge me. I was just looking for some fun. Anyways, I was stupid and gave out more information than I should have. I was chatting with a guy. 
He had asked me at some point what I did for work. At the time, I was working at McDonald's, so I told him. He asked which one. I stupidly told him which one. We chatted off and on. We hadn't been chatting for too long. I also stupidly gave him my phone number at some point. He would talk about how he wanted to meet me on my break and give me some fun on my break. I told him no thanks. I don't bring my lifestyle to my job. Anyway, so I checked my messages just before I was due to clock out of work. Luckily, I did. He mentioned that he was at my job and told me what he ordered. I think it was the Big Mac meal. I was like, um, okay, well, don't expect me to do anything with you. I'm not interested. He then got upset and wasn't accepting that I wasn't interested. I was also scared because I had sent him a face picture of myself, but I had never received one from him. I really wasn't too interested in him, so I decided I didn't need a face picture since I likely wasn't going to be meeting up with him. His interests weren't what I was looking for, and I have a hard time just straight up saying that I'm not interested, and I just slowly started to ghost whoever I had no interest in. Now, luckily, I hadn't told him my work schedule, so he didn't know that I was about to clock out. So, I, after clocking out, told one of my managers that I was on a dating site, and some guy just showed up to my work, and I have no idea what he looks like, and that I was going to hang out in the back in the break room for a bit. Luckily, she didn't judge me and was just like, oh, okay. So I waited about a half an hour before I left. I didn't have a car at the time and had to walk home, and I was afraid that he would see me and try to pick me up in his car. Luckily, no one followed me, so I was in the clear. I don't think he ever messaged me, or maybe I ended up blocking him or something. I don't know if this is really all that creepy, but it creeps me out that some random person just decided that he would show up to my job and expect me to want to meet up with him. So yeah, now I give vague responses as to where I work. I don't work in the same town that I live in, so it would be hard to pinpoint my exact location. This opened my eyes and made me more aware of the information that I give out to strangers. For years, I didn't even remember that this happened. I just blocked it from my memory. I'm not exactly sure of my age when this happened, but I believe I was around four or five years old. It was morning. My mom and I went to a pharmacy a couple of blocks away from our home. As soon as she was getting back in the car, a man approached her from behind and told her to act as if she knew him and to sit in the passenger seat. She noticed that he had a gun, so she complied. He sat in the driver's seat and drove. During the whole way, my mom tried to calm me down, telling me that he was a friend and needed a ride, while I sat in silence. He drove us to a road where he got out of the car, stole the money that my mom had with her, and told her not to call the police. After that, she just drove us back home. Almost a year ago when I was an opener at a resort, clocking in before 5 a.m. each day, the resort is located inside of an affluent neighborhood in a very wealthy town slash suburb. Employees had to park in one of the two parking lots at either ends of the property, and the lot that I chose was adjacent to a long and windy road outside the resort, which led to the rest of the neighborhood. The road and resort were separated by a short range of brush and trees that no one ever walked through. I'd arrived one morning per usual and put the car into park with my headlights still on. The lights in the lot weren't ever on in the morning since no one else really showed up before 6 a.m. when the sun was out, so it was usually always dark at the start of my walk. Save for security, I was one of the first employees to arrive on property each morning and was usually completely alone in this particular parking lot at this time. This morning didn't seem any different. I had my hand literally at my keys, my brain in the process to turn off my car, when I noticed a young girl, maybe 14 or 15 years old, come scampering, 
Her body language was the exact definition. Run with quick light steps, especially through fear or excitement, through the span of trees that separates the resorts from the outside road. She was directly in front of my car, and my headlights illuminated a clear view of her in the pitch black. She looked like she was in high school, had long blonde hair, and was wearing a jacket with pajamas maybe. Like she'd just walked out of a house. One thing about her that bothered me was that she wouldn't stop laughing and smiling. I couldn't hear her laughing from outside the car, but she was visually giggling at something that I wasn't aware of or could see, and it was so unnatural. She occasionally glanced behind her as if someone else were there waiting away from the headlights. She then waved at me like it were a normal gesture at this time, and then immediately ran to my passenger side door. This all happened in a matter of seconds, and I wasn't really sure what was even happening besides my anxiety spiking. I know that I simultaneously yanked the aux from my phone to shut whatever song had been playing off, while grabbing for the lock button. I remember feeling panic for never remembering if it's up or down to lock, when the girl began pulling violently and incessantly on the door handle on the passenger side. I realized because I didn't turn my car off that it'd stay locked. She began pounding on the window, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs for her to leave before pressing on my horn. I could see her laughing outside like this were some type of game, as if I were a silly friend not letting her in as a joke. After a few seconds, she stopped the pounding and trying to open my car door. Her face fell flat like I disappointed her, and she started to walk away from my car back the way she came. She waved at me again before squeezing through the trees, out of the view of my headlights. This whole encounter confused me, almost as much as it scared me. Most people I told the story to just chalked it up to her being on drugs, but that narrative hasn't felt right to me despite her behavior. Maybe she was just being an extremely out-of-touch teenager whose parents needed a firmer grip on her. My first thought was possibly human trafficking, but I'm not sure if that would fit this scenario as I'm not the most well-versed with the subject. I told someone when I made it inside, but they didn't seem to care much. I didn't call the police and I regret that. I'll never get out of my brain though. How off the feeling was watching a stranger, seemingly alone, pop out from the trees in the darkness laughing and then try to violently enter my car in an empty parking lot. I do think the possibility of someone else being present the whole time is a lot more scary. And I wonder who else was there and exactly where they were. My mother was stationed at Kadena Air Force Base around the late 2010s, and being a military child at the age of 12, my life had reset once again. I didn't have friends again, and I had to learn an entire new neighborhood. I didn't really have anything that made me ecstatic. That is, except the Pokemon League held on base. It was ran by a few people who earned their judge cards from Nintendo, and held tournaments and just open game nights. It was really fun picking up the card game, playing in the video game. They even had a small gym and Elite Four system. I made a lot of friends, and one of them was one of the judges, who I am thankful still to this day, because if it wasn't for him, I may not be able to be writing this story right now. The judge in question, who we will call Professor Getsu, for the sake of anonymity, was a nice dude. He was the youngest of the three and wore a white professor getup. He looked maybe on the edge of his teens, early 20s, with dark hair and glasses and a skinny frame. He was extremely helpful to newcomers, sort of like the big brother that we could all look up to and strive to beat in our children's cards and video games. Even if his game name was Getsu, was a bit nerdy even for me. He was always one of the last people to leave, helping to clean up and he supposedly lived nearby. This last thing is important for what's about to happen. It was a bit of a colder night when the event ended. I was sitting outside in the parking lot, scrolling through memes that my friends texted me as I waited for my parents to arrive to pick me up. 
I was just kind of zoning out as the time clicked by when I heard someone nearby. Hey, hey, girly, you play Pokemon? I would look up at some really big dude, kind of chubby looking. I saw him every now and then in the events, and he didn't really stand out too much. I gave a small nod, said, yeah, I do, as he gives this wide smile, like creepy wide. He starts walking forward, and I am hit with this nasty stench, like bad body odor. I blink a bit as I see he's walking from a black sedan with his back door open. I got this cool card collection. Come here, let me show you. Now, my parents have always taught me stranger danger, but my kid brain thought, hey, he went to events and I saw him, so it should be fine. At least, so I thought, until he grabbed my wrist and started to drag me to the sedan. To say that I immediately started screaming is an understatement. Stinky didn't care, though. He was still dragging me, saying how I will have fun and throwing out things about trading cards like someone listening would think that he was dealing with a whiny kid. I honestly thought that I was going to be taken, and I would never see my mom and dad again, that I would be on the back of a milk carton and never seen again. Silly, I know, but I was rather sheltered about dying and death at the time. Thankfully, Professor Getsu had walked out at that very moment, presumably on his way to walk home. All I know is I hear the sound of fabric hitting this dude's face, as Professor had swung his Professor coat right into the dude's face. I feel his hand go to where the dude's grabbing my arm, and I see his hand grab Stinky's pingy finger and yank back. Hard. Stinky let go and yowled like an animal as Professor pushed me back behind him as he yanked his coat off the dude. He then kicked at the back of the dude's knees as he caused him to buckle as Professor grabbed his wrists and pulled back on them. Stinky groaned in even more pain, as Professor looked at him with just a cold look in his eyes. The big brother figure was gone, and something else was in its place, and I think I was a bit scared of it. Professor's tone of voice when he spoke didn't help either, like icy daggers lingered with his words against Stinky. If I see you back here, or doing this stuff to my charges... This will pale in comparison to what Japanese prisons will do to you. Stinky would scramble away and get into his car and peel out of the parking lot, Professor glaring at him till he was out of sight. He would then guide me inside of the venue, buy me some fish and chips, and sit down with me until my parents arrived. That cold persona he had when he kicked that dude was gone, back to being the big brother that I knew. To be frank, that frightened me. I didn't quite understand why the teenager was so aggro. I only later learned that Professor Getsu was a black belt who taught kids how to defend themselves with his mother at the local activity center. I suspect that he had something of a protective persona or something in his own life that led him to act in such a way. He explained the situation to my folks when they arrived. I wasn't allowed to go to the events and league as much as I used to, but I still did from time to time. Professor Getsu was still his normal self at the events and helping people, but he would stop coming to the events a year afterwards, his license having expired and his father moving out of the country soon. Reaching about the same age as he was, and with a little sibling on my own, I sympathize with how, for a brief moment, he became something terrifying, just to make sure that I was safe. Oh, and as for Stinky, he never showed up to the events, and he was either banned or just scared of Professor Getsu. I wish the professor a good life, and I hope that he's doing well. As for Stinky, I wish that we never ever meet again. Just to preface this story, I have been clean from all drugs since 2019. It took me a while to write this. I never thought that I would be posting because of how stupid I was and the stupid mistakes that I made. I know I'll get a lot of duh comments on here, so don't even say it. I already know. I'm telling this story to remind people that everyone's intentions are not what they say they are. 
I'm mentally traumatized from this experience and I get reminders of it every day. I'm grateful to be alive and I have no idea what would happen if I didn't get away when I did. So save the rude and cruel comments. Thanks. This story is based in September of 2017, I believe. I'm not 100% sure because it's such a blur. I did whatever I could to survive in this harsh world, so please, no judgment. I was on the streets, no family, with an active crack, soon to be meth addiction. Backstory. I started using crack in 2015 and figured out that if I sold my body, I could make easy money. I know, not ideal, but I was deep in addiction, and at that point, I didn't care about anything. But in January of 2017, I met Ty, who also smoked crack, but worked every day, so I no longer had to do that. I was going on like eight months free from selling my body and soul. Also, when I met Ty, he had a place in this big city, and he did a lot of work for people in this city. I was left on the street by the man that I thought I had loved at the time. I must have said or did something wrong because he flipped out and left with everything that I owned in his truck. We had just spent days getting high together and I was sure that he was just throwing a fit. So I went over to my friend, let's call him E's house. It was my home away from home and I felt safe there. E was older, maybe 60 year old man who liked to get high and over time he became one of my best friends. I was able to take a shower and put on clean clothes. When I was all done, I remember sitting on the couch with disbelief that Ty would leave me like that. I started crying and wishing things had been different, while E held me and comforted me. I knew deep down that I needed a fresh start, to depend on myself and live a happy life. Across the street from E's house was a hometown bar where rappers and musicians would perform, and on that particular night, the bar had been filled with people from the bigger city about a half an hour away. Let me explain. Where I come from, there isn't really a place for addicts to go and get clean. They do have a women's shelter, which I had been to before. About 30 minutes away is a bigger city where they have all the help you can ask for, if you're willing to do the work. At this point, I was ready to get away from everyone and everything. I had no hope of cleaning up my life if I stayed anywhere close to where I was using. Remember, you have to remove old playmates, playthings, and playgrounds, so that's what I needed to do. I went right over to the bar and found a semi-good looking guy heading back to the city that I needed to go to. I told him that I had planned to go to the shelter in the morning, and he told me that I could just go with him, and he'll take me in the morning. On the ride, I remember feeling like a whole 100 bricks were lifted off my shoulders. I had nothing but the clothes on my back and an Obama phone with no minutes. I asked the guy that was driving. I said, you don't mess with this, right? And I pulled out my crack pipe. He shook his head, so I rolled down the window and just let it go. I knew that was going into this shelter. I had to get better. Not just for me, but I had kids and a family that at that time still hoped I would get better. I wanted to start over. I just didn't know how hard it was gonna be. Me and this random dude go to his friend's house. We smoke a blunt and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up on the floor of a clean room. I mean clean, there was nothing in it. It smelled like paint as I looked around. I realized this was the place the dude was talking about moving into and renting. I got up and he took me to get a coffee and right over to the shelter. I was so terrified of what I was walking into. I had no idea what to expect. All I knew was I needed to better my life and I needed to do it now. As we drove into downtown, I got a little nervous because I knew downtown was full of crime and drug dealers, big buildings and confusing signs, tons of people in traffic. I then realized that I was going to have to work really hard to get my life back. We pulled onto the street and before I knew it, he was dropping me off. There I was, standing in this big, beautiful, clean lobby, just feeling lost and broken. I had been with Ty for almost seven months, and this was the first time he left me like this. So I was still kind of hurt over that. I knew he had been seeing someone else in our recent month breakup, and he wasn't afraid to show it. 
It smelled like lime with spotless white walls. I walked up to the desk, and I was asked if I was homeless. Yes, I said, and she didn't even ask any questions. She just looked at me with sad eyes and said, Okay, hon, let's get you set up. She took me to a small room full of boxes as she hands me one. She explained that it was for my personal things, toilets, etc. I looked at her with unsettling eyes and replied that I didn't have any belongings, that I had lost everything the night before. The nice lady gave me some toiletries and a pair of leggings. Next was the intake where I had to answer a bunch of questions and was handed a paper with all the rules on it. And on the top of the paper, it stated there was no Wi-Fi in or around the building. You had to go down to the stop sign to get internet. My phone was off, but I could still use Wi-Fi. But at that time, I wasn't really that worried about it. I knew that Ty was already probably staying with that other girl. Michelle was her name. So I didn't feel like it was necessary to even try to use my phone. I decided to cut off everyone and try to be different. When she was done giving me the rundown on how things worked, she took me into the day room. Walking from the lobby was weird, and I remember feeling sick going through the double doors with stairs off to the left. Under the stairs was a pile of mats. I was told to grab one. I followed her through another set of double doors into the day room, which was huge. It was filled with at least 50 females, a lot of older ladies with nowhere to go, but it was loud and bright. The wall to my left was full of lockers, which I was told that I would get one if I stayed there long enough. And in front of that wall was about 10 to 15 round tables set up where most of the girls were sitting, playing cards, coloring and talking. On the other side of the room was the shower slash bathroom and a small TV that sat on a cart with wheels on it. Next to the cart was an end table that had an electrical strip full of chargers and phones. In the far back right corner was a door that led outside to go smoke. It was nice. There were picnic tables and lawn chairs set up with a huge fenced-in yard for the kids to play in. When 7 p.m. hit, the whole dynamic of the room changed. Everyone was moving around. People were running in. And then you would hear it over the speaker. Roll call. Then we were instructed to go and get one mat to sleep on. They passed out blankets and pillows to those who were without any. And they just let us keep the TV on. The first night was scary and lonely. Here I was in a strange place, not even two full days clean off a week-long crack binge. I was up half of the night with my head just racing. I finally fell asleep when the other girls started to get quiet. The morning came way too fast, and the rule was that you had to get up at 7 a.m. You didn't have to leave, but you did have to get up. A lot of the older ladies didn't even leave the shelter. They knew that they had a place to stay and had nothing else to do all day, so they hung out together at the shelter all day long. I had to go upstairs for breakfast, which was okay. I'm not really a breakfast food person, but that morning I was starving. I had the whole deal, eggs, bacon, and milk. After breakfast, I went out to smoke, and I noticed this tiny girl with cornrows in her hair had some cards in her back pocket. I had been playing cards since I was a kid. My dad taught me a few games. I played with friends, and I also had done some time in jail in the past. I was lonely. I didn't know where anything was, and it was obvious that I needed help. I asked her her name and if she wanted to play cards, and after two games, we had a connection. She was cool, and she liked me, so I was okay with that. I can be awkward around new people, and females tend to not like me, so I find it hard sometimes to make friends. She asked me after we played a few more games of rummy if I wanted to go to McDonald's with her. I was cool with that because I needed to learn the area anyway. On the walk there as we were talking, something caught my eye. So I looked up and there he was, Ty, with all of my belongings in his truck. He drives right by us. I tried to call, but he ignored me every time. I guess he was done with me for good this time. That crushed me. I wanted to fall to the ground and just sink until I disappeared. But instead, I had about 10 different emotions running through my body all at once. I was so angry that he was just looking for a reason to leave me since the month before when we broke up and I stayed with my dad for a while. He started seeing this Michelle. I was just absolutely devastated. 
We continued our walk to McDonald's and I was silent and broken. That night was easier to sleep because I was exhausted from not having any sleep and just feeling done. I slept like a baby to be honest. The next day, Mish wanted to show me this place that she goes to to get a good free lunch. The only thing was it was a church and we had to sit through a 30 minute sermon, but that was cool with me. We were standing outside waiting on the church to open their doors when this blacked out Mercedes Benz with a trailer hauling a really cool Harley pulled up and parked in front of the church. I then heard my loud mouth say, dang, that's a nice setup. I looked at Mish and then looked back at the Harley. That's when I saw him. I specifically remember everyone knowing who he was. Will is what they called him. I remember getting excited to meet new people and be a part of a new community. Everyone was really nice going into the church. A guy at the door walking in gave us a pamphlet of meal times and services offered. I followed Mish to one of the back pews and slid in behind her. The church was pretty, different colors, and there was a choir singing in a low and almost quiet tone as people around us were taking their seats. I kind of froze when that guy I saw came in. He sat next to me. I looked at Mish, and then I quickly noticed his gold watch. It could have been fake, but it almost looked like a Rolex. He was an older guy, and he talked real smooth when he introduced himself with his hand out. I was shocked that he wanted to shake my hand. No one in my life does that. I shook his hand, and they were creamy, like he takes very good care of them, and obviously does not work a physically demanding job. He was nicely dressed and had this pimp hat on like a fedora. It even had a feather in it. His cologne was strong but smelled good, like a man. He was handsome and smooth. He was also very confident. Setting through this sermon, I found it hard to pay attention to the preacher. I remember looking at this clean, shiny black leather shoes, and the socks were black and thick. When the service was finally over, people started heading into the dining area. I just followed Mish through, and we got our food. She picked an empty space to eat on one of the end of the long tables full of chairs. Not even five minutes, not paying attention to our surroundings, just eating. Will came over and sat three seats away from me. He looked at Mish and said, Do you mind? I don't know why I didn't see the red flags. Of course I see them now, but looking back I was so clueless. He hardly said a word the whole time we were eating, and when he was done, he got up and threw his stuff away, and I assumed that he left. Misha and I decided to go home, play some cards, and go to a clothes bank that she knew about. We were walking home and talking when he pulled up next to us. He rolled down his window, and he asked if we needed a ride home, but he was looking at me with a deep stare. I looked back at Misha, and she refused. Smart girl. But I went with him. Dumb girl. I think I was more curious than anything. I had to know how he made that kind of money. And I really remember wanting that. We drove around till my curfew and just talked. I don't know what it was. I think we had a lot in common and we related a lot. He asked me how I ended up at this shelter and just asking questions. So I told him. I don't know what it was. I'm not sure if I trusted him but I told him about my past anyway, how I sold my body for drugs and how horrible it was. And I even said that I was glad that I didn't do it anymore. He didn't say much about it. And we agreed that we could continue our talk the next day. And he would help me put in a couple of applications and he had some errands too. I woke up in the morning to a text from Will that said, what if you made that kind of money? Just spend it on yourself, not drugs. Everything you make will go to building your life. Just think about it. I thought about it. I'm not going to say why I agreed and went with the idea that this would work and I could actually get my life together and get my kids back. $200 per half hour. I could be free. I chose to go with him. At that time, I think he thought that I wanted to be with him, but really, I just wanted a way out of the situation that I was in. I hated that stinky loud shelter. I wanted out. He got a room at a motel, and we dropped off my stuff, and he told me that I needed some new clothes. He did tell me that he was just fired from a trucking company. He was a truck driver. 
He was currently trying to find another job as far as I knew. He took me shopping and got me a few new outfits. More or less outfits to take pictures and to bring the money. I knew what I was getting into, and I was preparing my mind to handle everything that was about to happen. Will did tell me that if I went with him, I had to stay clean and have a clear mind to make money and be smart. Looking back at how manipulative he was and made me believe that I would do this to make my life better. I started doing this before I got addicted a few times to make rent or bills, so I knew that I could mentally do it, but I was still unsure about where this was going to go. We went back to the hotel and I do my thing, take my pictures and post them. It didn't take long before I started to get calls. I did make some money and I kept every penny and Will took me shopping. I remember the shoes I bought. They were black and gold baby fats. Oh, I love those shoes. I got like six or seven cute outfits, some makeup and hair dye. Remember, I came to the shelter with nothing. So being able to get all this stuff made me feel so good. I was confident in myself and hopeful that I could get a place or start a new life within a few weeks, if days like that repeated itself. Remembering how things went, I'm starting to think that I was a part of his game. Making girls think that they can do it and keep all the money, and then just trap them and make them need you. It's sick. He tricked me. He made me think I could finally live a clean life. Yeah, I was escorting, but I treated it like a job. I bought another phone so I had a new number and used the Obama phone for work and turned it off at like 5 p.m. I thought wrong. I later that day went back over to the shelter and grabbed the one shirt I had and some personal things and I left with Will. That night was cool. He was super chill. We talked in separate beds. We got a two bed and he didn't act like he had interest in me like that which I was happy about because I didn't want to be with anyone. I needed a break from emotional attachment. After Ty left me, I felt like I wouldn't trust anyone like that in a long time. So I was happy that I was comfy in a bed, watching TV, freshly showered with money in my pocket. I had the best night's sleep and woke up to a breakfast and time to get up and get myself together. He got up early, went and got us breakfast and coffee, he ate with me and then left. Said he would be back in a couple of hours. Take my time and do what I gotta do. So I did just that while he was gone. I dyed my hair. Took a shower in the works. Not long after I was done and waited for him, the door opens and a female walks in. She's pale and has a beautiful face. Long, pretty blonde hair that ran down to her shoulders. She was really petite. Way too skinny. Pretty big blue eyes and had dark circles under them. It looked like she had been crying and she was carrying a black trash bag that contained all of her possessions. Will walked in behind her and introduced her as Anna and she needs some help too. He instructed me to get her together, get her pretty and take some pictures and post them. He then told her to go on and take a shower and then asked to talk to me outside we went outside the door, and as I was shutting it, his voice got real stern and said, I see you haven't made any money yet, and why the hell is that? I tried to explain that Sundays are the slowest days, and I would be lucky to make any money today. Before I could finish, he cut me off and said, I don't give a crap. You need to make some effing money. What you think this hotel pays for itself? I'll pay for it tonight. But from now on, you pay half, and half of all expenses. Now go make some effing money. I couldn't even believe that he was talking like this. I had never seen him so angry, and his voice scared the hell out of me. I looked at him when he cut me off, and I could see him get angry. His eyes got wide, and the white just disappeared, and they became all black. I was scared, but I did what he said. He then left me alone with her while he went out and got food and whatever he did. When Anna got out of the shower and her skin was more exposed, as she walked out of the bathroom in a small towel, I knew she was addicted to IV use. I assumed heroin. She confirmed it after I asked her if it was going to be a problem to not do drugs, because that was his rule for me. Why wouldn't it be a rule for the other girls? After my kid's father passed away from an overdose, I didn't like to surround myself with girls that I knew I could get close to, try to help, and something happen. 
So I cut all of that out. And when she told me, I was like, okay, no girl, I'm sorry. You're going to have to make some calls because you can't stay here. At that point, I didn't even care what Will had to say. I didn't want her here, period. As soon as he came through the door, I stopped him and took him outside. I just told him I didn't think that I could work with her. I didn't want to be around a heroin addict or any kind of addict for that matter. He did make her pack her bathroom and clothes up and took her home. I think he was trying to please me for some reason, looking back. Will and I then took a ride to Main Street, where all the girls walk and work. It was so weird. Remember how I said that he knew everyone at the church? He knew all those girl, business owners, police officers, and other men who drove drug dealer cars. I don't know why I didn't just run then. I'll never know. About an hour or two of driving around talking to a bunch of different girls, this random girl jumps in the car. It was crazy. They had known each other for years, I guess, and she had been looking for him and wanted to make some money. She was quite a bit older than me, but still really pretty, like beautiful. She had long, thick, curly, jet black hair. I didn't really get a good look at her until we got back to the hotel. Will told me that he wanted to get a few girls together and make some big money. I was always going to be number one, and I will never post with another female because I am number one. He told me I was important, and we were building our own family. Amy was tall and thick, but she was gorgeous. Big blue eyes, pretty skin, small waist, and she was a straight-up B-word. She took benzos. They were prescribed to her, so I guess he allowed it. It wasn't long before I couldn't help but watch her. She was popular, and then like at night, she would be falling out and nodding off. It drove me crazy. I think I even started a fight with Will about it once. I didn't think it was fair, honestly. Like, she can get high, but I can't? <laughs> yeah, right. What Will would do was during the day, he would leave me at the hotel to make money, and he took Amy to the street and worked her. Well, it wasn't two days before they came home with another girl. Young one. 18. Her choice, no family. I only know what they tell me. Her name was Amanda. She was short like me and a little chunky, which was okay. Guys like chunky too. She had blonde long hair and a cute face. She was sweet and didn't say much. I tried to get to know her a little better, but she wasn't around for long. I posted her with Amy, and she didn't get much of a feedback. More people were calling for Amy. Amanda stayed with us for a few days before she decided she wanted to go home. Will, Amy, and I didn't stay at the hotel for long before we ended up deep into the city, the farthest away from my hometown. Bigger room and a little nicer hotel with a view of the whole city. It had a crappy little microwave and a drive-up entrance to your room. Will and Amy brought home two girls that night. I don't remember them much because I wasn't involved much with them. I posted them and the next few days we made money. Every time a girl would make money, they would give it to Will because he had them believe that he was saving it for them and getting them anything they wanted. I continued to make money on my own and I also gave him my money. I got conspicuous and I will never forget the moment that I knew I was not safe. I was outside smoking a cigarette. I wasn't out there long, but when I came back into the room, Will had all three girls posing on the bed as he was coaching them on how to pose and taking pictures of them. I didn't say a word and closed the door slowly. I don't know why I felt the way I did, but it just didn't feel right. I don't know if he heard me open and close the door, but I heard him yell my name and said he needed me. He handed me his phone and told me to post the pictures. When I got on the website and tried to post the pictures, it now wanted money instead of posting ads for free. Will unhappily ran to wherever and put money on a card. When I tried to put the card in, it wouldn't accept it and said it wanted bitcoins. I informed Will and even showed him the page that it wasn't going to post. He got furious and yelled at me. He turned and walked out of the room. I looked at everyone else and tried to apologize for his actions and to stay calm. It'll be okay. He came right back with his gun in his hand. I didn't even know he owned a gun. He hit me in the face with it and said I needed to find a place to post the ad. Do it or I'm done. 
and then left. I don't know if he realized that he did that in front of the three other girls, and I didn't know what or I'm done meant either. I was terrified, and that's when I knew that I had to find a way to escape. I learned real quick that I wasn't able to just leave any time I wanted anymore. After Amy got involved, Will changed. He started talking about taking us girls to New York and make big money and travel and go here and there, and that alone scared the hell out of me. I wanted to build a life to get my kids back, not leave the state to trick, and maybe get killed or abandoned. No, F that. I got fearful for my life when he hit me with that gun. I have been hit before, punched like a man, but I have never been hit with a gun. That night, I had a couple dates set up, and Will knew he had to take the other girls and leave. I decided to try and make a plan to get away, the first date, I made 200 I put 50 in my purse, and then put 50 in a pocket in a bra hidden away, and I left the rest on the table. The second date, I made 150 put half hidden away, and the rest on the table. Will came in the door not long after I was finished and grabbed the money off the table. My purse was sitting right there, and I didn't see him do it, but he took that money out of my purse and said he had to do something and left again. That was when I made my escape. I made a hundred calls before I finally reached someone who was willing to help me. He had a friend come pick me up and bring me to his house. I will never forget the feeling I had when I was running out to the car with a trash bag full of stuff I have collected in the past three weeks. I was scared to death that he would come pulling up and see me. That feeling didn't leave me until we hit the highway. I wanted to tell this story because I have never been able to get through telling it. I couldn't help to think where I would be if I stayed and if I would even be alive. So, to Will, let's never meet again. I answered the door for a guy who was dressed as a UPS driver. He had the logo on his jacket and everything. I assumed my parents had ordered something that I needed a sign for, so I answered it. After opening the door and greeting him, I realized that not only did he not have anything for me, but there wasn't even a UPS truck in sight. He told me his name was Tony and that he was selling lawn care services around the neighborhood. I started to figure that maybe he was just a UPS worker who forgot to change clothes before starting his second job as a landscaper or gardener. But then he started asking me weird questions, like if we have any security cameras or large dogs in our house. We do have security cameras, but they're quite hidden, and I told him that we did not. And even though our largest dog is a one-year-old beagle, I told him that we have two pit bulls. This entire time, he wasn't looking at me. He was almost looking around me, letting his eyes coast around the inside of my house, probably looking for visible sights of something valuable. He then asked me the weirdest question. He asked why I had my door cracked instead of opened all the way. I lied and said it was because I didn't want my pit bulls to see him and start going nuts. Truth is, I always do this when I answer the door for strangers, so I can close it as fast as possible should they try something. He then gave me a poorly made flyer for his supposed lawn care business and went off down the street to the next house. I shut my door and locked all of the locks on it. Tony, I hope I don't see you on the news anytime soon. I've changed some small details here and used a throwaway because I don't want this to ever get traced back to me. When this took place, I, a female in my 20s back then, was finishing my degree in the city and working as a casual receptionist at a firm. One of the employees, Nick, told me one day that one of his clients, who he said was a stand-up guy, thought I was very cute and wanted to see if I would be okay to give him my number. We went to dinner and he was charming enough. He was in the medical field and was about seven years older, but I didn't mind as my own parents had a similar age gap between them. We talked about my studies, and he told me he thought my rather run-of-the-mill family life was amazing because his life was so different. 
He was adopted as a baby and his father was abusive. When he was 15, his mother left and he never saw her after that. He was kicked out at 18 and ended up in a terrible car accident in his early 20s. For a long time, he stayed at a relative's house and worked to support himself. Yeah, heavy conversation on the first date. But all I felt was this overwhelming compassion for this poor human who had been through so much. He seemed nice. He was smart. Handsome. And though he was just a touch too serious, given his life, I figured that was understandable. We ended up dating, but by the third week, things started to feel a bit weird. He refused to introduce me to any of his friends because his last ex had left him for a friend. He also hated that I had male friends because of the same reason, and he would insist on reading any text that I sent or received from them. I made excuses in my head for him like, people need to heal, or sometimes they need a crutch before they can learn to trust, or, well, it's not like I have anything to hide. He started being critical of the way that I spoke or acted and dressed. He was also super insistent we move in together, but I felt that it was way too soon. In arguments, sometimes he would get a weird look in his eyes that made me feel unsettled. And I once tried to break the tension by half joking, you look like you want to hit me, to which he responded, I wouldn't bother if it came to that, I would just kill you. I was so shocked I didn't even react to that until days later. Recounting it, red flags were everywhere. But though it might be hard to realize, I was actually convinced that I was falling in love with him. Most of the time he was perfect. Until he wasn't. But he would explain that that was only because he had so many issues from his past, and I would believe him. Then one day, I told him what I thought was a funny story about a random guy in my class who asked for my number. This guy had asked under the guise of getting notes for classes that he'd missed but I only offered my college email address, explaining that I had a boyfriend. Hilariously, as soon as class ended, I saw this guy annoyedly throwing the paper I wrote my email on in the bin on his way out of the lecture hall. I expected my boyfriend to laugh, but he lost it. He accused me of leading the guy on, accused me of wanting to cheat. I was furious because I knew I had done nothing wrong. When he angrily threw a mug at the wall which shattered, the whole argument came to an abrupt halt. I was scared and angry, so I grabbed my bag and bolted out of his apartment. I thought he would stop me, but he didn't. I went home, cried about it to my cousin, a 30-year-old female who I was living with, and I assumed it was over. Days pass and I hear nothing from him, and within those days, I started questioning everything. Suddenly, it was as clear as day that this relationship was toxic and very unhealthy. Even if he did have a tough past, it wasn't my job to fix it and it wasn't an excuse for the way that he treated me. I was starting to accept that this was just a horrible near miss and get over it when he texted me, groveling apologies and how much he missed me, and I made the mistake of responding. He called and I picked up, but it was because I wanted to tell him that I still thought it wasn't going to work out. He cried, yelled at me, asked me how I could do this to him when I knew that everyone he loved in his life had abandoned him, and how could I do the same? He told me that he would never be able to love again and that it was all my fault. I had broken him. He told me that he had given me everything, but I was leaving over such a small argument. Then he apologized and told me that he was trying to change and to give him another chance. I was bawling my eyes out. I felt like the worst human in the world, but I held tight to saying that it was best that we moved on and that I was sorry. He ended the call by telling me that I had ruined his life. Nothing happened for a while except for texts here and there where my ex would apologize, tell me he missed me, explain that he realized that he made so many mistakes, etc. I would tell my cousin who I was living with about him, and she would firmly tell me to not respond. She was sure that it would stop eventually. One day, I finished work as usual and headed to the station. It was a busy day and the streets were scattered with other people. As I walked, I had this weird urge to look behind me, and when I did, I saw my ex. There was a little distance between me and him, but when I saw him, our eyes locked. He looked different, a bit out of it, and I thought that maybe he was drunk. I decided I would deal with him at the train station, as it was always crowded and I wanted to talk to him only in a place where there were lots of people. I figured the yelling and crying would not be as intense that way. 
When I reached the station, I stopped and waited for him to catch up to me. He stopped about two feet away and I expected him to start apologizing again, but he said nothing. He just stared at me. Awkward seconds pass and I said, look, but that's all I got out because his arm moved slightly as he took his hand half out of his pocket and I saw that he was holding a very small knife. I froze and vaguely remember thinking that I wanted to run, but it was like my brain and body shut down. I can only describe it as if there was a fog in my brain and I just couldn't move for what felt like ages. I just stared at him and I still remember how his eyes just looked so blank. I don't know how long that lasted, but then without saying anything, he just turned and left. Nobody else had noticed. I remember numbly getting on the train. I started second guessing if that even happened. Hindsight tells me I was in shock. As soon as I got home though, I burst into tears. My cousin calmed me down and helped me call the police. In the end, the security cameras weren't placed in a spot that could clearly show that he had a weapon, so the police couldn't do much. Thankfully, I didn't see my ex again. I ended up quitting my job, changing my number, and eventually, I moved away to another city. Okay, so bear with me. This happened when I was a kid, and I double-checked the story with my family. So this was in the mid-80s. I was about seven at home with two of my older sisters, around eight and eleven-ish, and two cousins, seven and eight-ish. All five were girls. My sister, who was eleven, was in charge of babysitting us four younger girls. You have to picture what our house looked like to understand what happened. It was a two-story box house with a flat roof and a small box front porch, also with a flat roof. I can't remember what we were doing, but we were all in the house. We kept hearing noises coming from the roof like walking and what sounded like rocks being dropped down the downspouts. You know, kids, we thought of a squirrel or something, but it kept happening. Then my older sister said something about how maybe someone climbed the huge tree beside the house and got on the roof. We were all scared because we knew there was a roof access point in the bedroom that I shared with one of my sisters. What if he could get inside? My older sister told my other sister and one of our cousins to walk across the street to the corner store, across an empty gravel parking lot, and on the way back, look up and see if they could see someone on the roof. So the girls, both about eight years old, walk halfway across the parking lot and being curious turned around looked up and saw a guy in one of those totally 80s guys crop top football jerseys think johnny depp in a nightmare on elm street he was crouched down on the roof the girls came running home freaking out and told my sister about the guy my older sister freaking out first went to the neighbor's house to use their deck to see if she could see on our roof but couldn't see anything she came home and then called the police it felt like it took them ages to show up when they got there, I don't think they believed a word we said. They thought a bunch of little kids are making up this story for attention. One cop drove down the road, up a hill about a block away, to see if they could see anything. But the way the roof was, you couldn't see a person if they were laying down. Then the cops tell us kids that we had to go upstairs and check everywhere to see if we found anyone. Five little girls from ages 7 to 11, sent upstairs, scared crapless, crying, to look for this man knowing about the roof access we all cried not wanting to go but they said that we had to to this day i remember how scared i was i remember looking but how well do little kids look right the cops didn't listen to us didn't check out the house inside or out and left we were so scared to be left home alone with the guy out there who knows where we didn't know if he was just laying down on the roof or jumped down or somehow got in and was hiding. My mom finally got home a few hours later and we told her what happened and my mom explained to us that there was a lock on the roof access and no one could get in, but she checked anyways. Then she went outside to check. There were clear footprints in the dirt, dug in good from him jumping off the roof, onto the porch, and off into the flower bed. Oh, my mom was so steaming mad when she realized that we told the truth 
and weren't believed by the police. We went to the police station the next day and were all separated and interviewed. We all told the same story. My mom went up one side of the cops and down the other. We never found out who the guy was or why he was there. Did he know it was a house with five little girls home alone? I guess I'll never know. Thank you for reading. This story happened a few months ago. At that time, I had moved out of my house for a professional reason, but I had to wait a couple of months before moving into my next house. To spend this time span, and since I can work from anywhere, I rented my very close friend Amy's holiday family house, which is otherwise empty, located in a village I grew up in in the countryside. I know this family and their house very well since I was a small child. The house is rather large. It has two floors and five bedrooms. It's located in a quaint or even remote area of the village, only surrounded by a forest and other empty holiday houses. While planning this, I was aware this setting could be scary, being a single 27-year-old female, but I hate to restrain myself in life because of unjustified fears, so I instead took a few measures to feel more safe. Before moving in, I had planned to go on a complete checkup of all the doors and windows. Once done, I would look into every room, under every bed, and inside all of the wardrobes. This way, I could be certain that the house was perfectly empty at that moment, and would stay so, as I will be very careful with closing doors, and I knew that there were no spare keys. So that when at night I would be scared, I could reason with myself and know that it's only in my head. I was accompanied by my mother to proceed to the checkup, as she lives close by. We faced a problem rather quickly while verifying doors and windows. Two glass doors from the patio were malfunctioning, and someone could just slide them open. The layout of the two doors was the following. One was looking towards the garden. The second one was between the patio and the rest of the house. This meant that someone could not only get inside the patio from the house, but also in the rest of the house. After this discovery, I called my friend Amy, and we agreed that I would find a locksmith. Amy's family's financial situation wasn't at its peak, so depending on the price, either only the door leading to the garden, or maybe both doors would get fixed. But the price was reasonable, thus the locksmith lady could change both locks. The patio was then perfectly sealed, however, according to her, the glass door leading to the garden was weak and one could easily open it if motivated. But since the glass door between the patio and the rest of the house was safe, I did not mind that remark. One could have as much fun as they pleased in the patio as long as I was safe in my house. After that and a successful second checkup, I was happy to move in. The first few days were a bit scary, but since I was careful with doors and the house's surroundings were so peaceful and lovely, it quickly became bliss to live there. I was heating myself up at the fireplace, eating good food, breathing fresh air. I felt very free and happy. Only, I had to notice a small odd detail in the very first day. A third glass door was not locking anymore. I got very surprised since I checked so carefully every single door during my checkup. This third door was right next to the one that got repaired, between the patio and the house. So this meant that the patio was not perfectly sealed anymore. But fine, I thought. All the doors leading to the outside were still locked, so no need to worry. I quickly moved on since I felt so happy there. I did not want any useless fear to bother me. I came to the conclusion that I must have missed it. And I was a bit ashamed that I got Amy's family to spend money on two locks, whereas it should have been three because of my carelessness. After two wonderful months living in a dream mostly on my own, since all my childhood friends moved out from the village, a friend came to visit me. We spent some time outside, and we had a drink at my place before I drove him back to his village about an hour away. While we were leaving my house, he even emphasized how meticulous I was with closing all the shutters behind ourselves. I told him it was key for me to feel so good in there. I was back home at around 10 p.m. I entered my perfectly sealed house and locked the door behind myself. While turning the key, out of the blue, sudden and intense goosebumps ran all over my scalp. 
I had never experienced such a feeling, and I was not even aware that a human body could get goosebumps into the scalp. With that came a very instinctive feeling of danger and being on my guard. I felt all of this so intensely that I was not able to ignore it, yet I knew that my house was kept perfectly closed. So I stayed cautious, but I walked through the entrance and came into the kitchen. There, on the floor, was lying a rectangular plastic bag. It was small and blue on the orange floor. I was surprised. I recognized it being a plastic bag to be filled with water to make ice cubes. It had nothing to do here. I had already seen these bags earlier, once I was looking for freezer bags to put my food and mistook them. I knew they were stored in a drawer at the very other side of the kitchen, and I knew that we did not use them, nor anything from that drawer with my friend earlier. This uncanny discovery confirmed my gut feeling, and I began to feel very uneasy. I sent a picture to my friend asking if he had touched or used these. He said, no, keep me in touch. I grabbed the knife and I started walking to the living room. Usually, whenever I would feel afraid in this house, I would go on a little checkup tour in every room to reassure myself. That is what I had on my mind at the moment, but this gut feeling was literally forbidding my body to do so. Instead, it walked me out of the house. I drove to my mother's place and slept there. A few days after, during a sunny afternoon, my mother and I came back and did a checkup thoroughly. Nothing was missing, nothing was broken, and no one was there. Everything stayed perfectly exactly as I had left it. With such evidence, I came to the conclusion that it must have been my friend who, by accident, took those bags and forgot about it. Then they must have fallen on the floor while I opened the door, or something like that. I came back in and kept living in a dream in this beautiful place for another month after that. Then, something else happened. For a few days, I had been hearing unusual noises which began to scare me, so I decided that it was time for a checkup. It was around 9 p.m. I began going in every room, looking under every bed. Downstairs all clear. I walked upstairs, opened the first bedroom, and surprise, the light was on. This caused me a small flinch. I never go to these rooms upstairs, and they remain closed at all times. Nevertheless, I walked towards the wardrobe, but before opening it, I get a second flinch as an unknown object is now laying on top of the furniture. I open. Nobody. I close. And I look at the object. It's an elongated black fabric sheath. Rather big, with a hook to carry it on a belt. A terrifying idea crosses my mind that it may be a knife sheath. But I brush it off, as I don't need my imagination to get crazy in such a situation. I finish my checkup. But despite nobody being found, I could not help but feel weird about the sheath and the light. I went to sleep at my mother's place that night too. The day after, I checked with my friend Amy. No family members came into the house while I was away, nor did they recognize this object as belonging to any of them. I dropped it off at the police station, and according to them, it's likely a hunting knife sheath indeed. Then I started thinking again about the patio's third door. It had been on my mind for weeks, but I had been dismissing the idea to avoid unnecessary fear. Reflecting back at my thorough entrance checkup, it is very unlikely that I would have missed a door. As well, the locksmith had changed the lock of the door right next to this one, and even stared at it to see how a well-functioning lock looked like. With Amy, we had first imagined that an old Airbnb tenant could have made a copy of the keys, and the locks had to be changed. But more and more I was sure this person was coming in and out of the house from the patio. Another locksmith came and looked at the third door's lock. She said, ah, yes, indeed. The lock part screwed on the door frame, where the lock embeds itself, had been screwed off. She also checked the door leading to the garden, her colleague had pointed out as easy to open. She said, ah, yes, that's obvious, ah, yes. Meaning in her laconic way, there was very little chance for all that to be a coincidence. I left the house for good after that. I believe a person had their little habits in this house, using the way I shut when I arrived, and they made sure to be able to reach inside the place despite my changes. Thinking that all this time I was living my life peacefully, reasoning with myself not to be scared, that the place was safe and locked, it actually 
was not. I've been sitting alone at home all day due to a storm, and I think I finally feel ready to speak about my experience with a girl that I met in college. No one has ever heard the full story, and I'm ready to tell most of it here. Not a preface. I, a 23-year-old female, was 19 going on 20 at the time of meeting this girl. I was also in an unstable and codependent relationship at the time and was utterly depressed, naive, and craving a sense of validation of my thoughts and feelings that no one around me at the time was willing to give me. So, subsequently, I was the perfect candidate to inflate and dote upon the literal God-complexed ego of this one girl. To begin with, I was in an acting 101 class my first semester of college and swore to myself that I wouldn't make friends in the two years that I was set to be there. This was a community college. I was to go in, get good grades, and leave. It wasn't until the third day, a week and a half since the semester started, and this girl walks in, and you could feel the air in the room grow thin. Her presence was both alluring and yet annoying at the same time. Charisma seemed to ooze out of her pores and shine like a halo from her hair. For more context, I'm from the United States, and when this girl began to speak with a British accent, everyone was confused yet intrigued. Apparently, she had just gotten here from a trip back to England with her father. Apparently, she was originally from there. That's when my first instinct rang clear. Why is it that if she has enough money to be flying to and from England, was she doing in an acting 101 class at a community college? I decided my curiosity was too frivolous and kept it to myself. Until the next class, when she asked me a question that I unfortunately no longer remember. However... I do remember my initial disgust with her demeanor. She seemed too bubbly, too poised. Something was just off. After that brief encounter, I felt that was all I'd ever hear from her. However, slowly, she would make remarks to me during the class, and eventually I started striking conversations as well. Then one day, after class, she mentions to me how expensive and annoying it is that she has to wait for an Uber every time class ends. I remember offering her a ride home as an alternative, but she would dramatically decline, saying things like how her parents would get angry with her for burdening me with the task of driving her around. I understood and felt pity for her after that. In that moment, I thought that she was in a household where her parents were overbearing and slightly abusive, so I decided I would try and befriend her outside of class. She seemed nice enough. I also had this pang in my heart to help her for some reason, and that was exactly what she wanted. So over time, as we grew closer, I would offer her a ride home. I would insist and say that I'm her friend and that friends help each other out. She seemed to enjoy these gestures. She'd compliment me and then go on to say how tough her life is without a license. Eventually she agreed, and I took her home. It was honestly really nice to have someone to talk about class with outside of class. Soon enough, after driving her home the past few classes, she invited me in for tea. I thought it was adorable, having afternoon tea and gossiping with a friend. She was British, after all. We both eventually opened up about ourselves and spoke on things besides class. She told me she was my age. She graduated the same year as me and also took a gap year. She said throughout school she'd traveled to and from England and I found it so fascinating. She was adopted from a third world country and was brought to England and then moved to her current town as she was six. She told me about past relationships, and I opened up about mine. She always seemed to be the same as me, like she was trying to emulate me in some way. It was so subtle, it was difficult to notice at first, but I told her about the apprehension I felt in my current relationship. She'd sympathize and tell a story about how her ex hurt her even worse. I would always take note of the things she said, because I was not only her friend, but we seemed to share the same experiences. However, hers were always more severe than mine. In hindsight, I know why it was like that, but at the time, I just thought about how unlucky this girl was and how bad I felt for her past. Soon, it became tradition to drink tea at her house after class, but I had to be out before her mom got home. 
And if I were to meet her mother, it would be bad. One day, her mom got home early and was surprised, yet delighted to see me. She introduced herself and I did the same, all while my friend sat and sulked in anger. Her mother seemed delightful, and I was surprised at how welcoming she was. She offered me food and gave me some crackers to take home. I eventually confronted my friend, asking why she would paint her mother to be that way. She said she was just kinder to guests than to her. I was confused, but I also fully understood. I have a mother who is similar to that, so I shook it off. One day in class, we got our midterm assignments. We were to prepare a nonverbal monologue in front of the class. We each get our assigned stage directions and are asked to prepare it in two weeks. One of the stage directions was that a girl comes home crying after having been SA'd. Another girl in our class received this one, but was uncomfortable doing it, and rightfully so. A boy in that class criticized her for not wanting to do it, and she ran out of the classroom. My friend and I followed her. The three of us opened up about our past assaults, and eventually calmed our classmate down. Time passes after that class and a few classes later, when I was walking with my friend to my car, she all of a sudden runs away from me. I follow her and I'm laughing at her. She had fallen ungracefully to the ground and was in the grass on her knees. I asked what she was doing, asked why she was being a weirdo. What she did was related to our conversation. She looks up at me with some kind of strange fear in her eyes and says that she saw her assaulter just then on the campus. I was shaken at this point because I don't remember seeing anyone walk anywhere near us. She said he walked by and stared at her evilly. I was very confused and said that she must have imagined it, but she was adamant. I was also even more confused because she had told me she had filed a restraining order against him. How could he be allowed on campus? If he really wanted to go to this same school, there were two campuses in two different towns, so surely he could have gone to the other campus. I asked all of these questions and was met with very little answers, obviously. She said she'd talk to her mother and handle it accordingly. It took weeks to even hear anything about it. I wanted her to bring it up, but she never did. So eventually I asked, and she gave me a story about how she went to the dean's office after a class and fixed things. I remember being confused because I had driven her after all of our classes, and she said that they went after I left. But that couldn't have been because the school offices closed after 5, and I would always leave at 5. Many of my questions were met with strange excuses, but I remember just letting it go. This was a sore subject after all, and I didn't want to upset her any more than she already was. Weeks pass and my friend and I eventually become inseparable. We seem to know the ins and outs of each other. We even hosted a Friendsgiving together at her house, with some of the people from our acting class. Then the end of the semester came, and I could feel the rift grow between us. I was confused and hurting. She said she wasn't going for a degree and was just there to take the acting class. I remember being confused. I thought she was a theater major like me. She had said she was, but I guess she changed her mind. She said that she was going to be auditioning for Lambda, London Academy of Dramatic Arts, in New York City early next year, and she was probably going to get in and was never going to see me again. I remember feeling confused. Why didn't she tell me this sooner? Why did she even get close to me in the semester? Then I thought about how it was probably my fault that I pushed her to be my friend, but I just felt so bad for her. It was like she was asking for a friend without telling me. Eventually, I convinced her that it would be good for her to be in a class with me again the next semester, partly because I wanted to selfishly keep her close and the other part because I knew from what she told me that if she never got into Lambda, that she'd probably end her own life. I feared for my friend so much that I wanted to push her to be in a class with me because she had somehow made me think that I was helping her not unalive herself. So she signed up for the class and decided to audition with me for the spring musical. But she wasn't to go with me because she auditioned alone and couldn't talk to anyone before she sang, which I guess was understandable. Soon, her audition for Lambda rolls around and I managed to come with her and her parents for that weekend. New York City is about an afternoon's train right away, and her parents were kind enough to pay for my ticket. How I managed to be invited was by her telling me how scared and terrified she was to be with her parents on this trip. So, I offered to come, to be a buffer between her and her parents' evil ways. 
I was met with polite no's, and eventually, just like all my kind offers, I was then met with a yes. Besides, I love New York City, and when I learned I didn't have to pay, I was even more excited. Now, for those who are this far, I want you to understand if you haven't already. It was like I was begging this girl to let me do anything for her. She'd answer me in a way that made things seem like I had to insist. Like if I didn't ask again, she would be hurt and it would be my fault. In other, simpler words, I was being manipulated into doing things for her. But it never felt like it, because I meant it. I was much more generous to my friends I had just met at the time then. So I arrive in Grand Central Station and was met with my friend and her mother. We walk to the hotel and everything seems normal. We go to sleep and I wake up. And to be honest, all I remember about that trip was how scared I sort of was of this new virus going around. It was January of 2020. And how surprisingly, her parents seemed to be such angels. I remember going to shops with them and they were just talking about how my friend would like this and how they wanted to make this for my friend and how we should go here after my friend was out of the audition. All her parents talked about was my friend. I was floored. I remember her telling me to stay in the room all day, to ignore her parents, but I didn't want to. I now see why. Eventually, we made our way to the New York Public Library. I remember going to the top floor, taking a picture of the painted ceiling, standing for about a minute, and then her parents find me and say that they have to go meet my friend right now. She was in need of some cherry-colored chapstick and some water. They told me to stay, that they'd meet me later and to explore the city. I said, absolutely not. I was not walking around alone in this massive city, no way. So I went with them. I witnessed their panic as they tried to hurry to our audition and find water and the right chapstick in time. All the while, my friend is texting them exactly what she wants and telling them to hurry. We walked about 20 minutes to this building. 20 minutes. My parents won't even come downstairs to tell me something let alone walk that far to bring me a water and chapstick. They decided, too, that it would take too much time to get a cherry-colored chapstick, and my friend would just have to use a plain one from her mom's purse. We get to the building and meet with her in the lobby. She goes to her parents and sees that they have no cherry chapstick and not the right water. She's furious. She gets mad and just storms into the audition room, never saying thank you. After that, we go and sit in a Panera Bread and wait another 20 minutes. Eventually, she gets out of her audition and meets us inside. She then was adamant on alienating me from her parents and only wanted to talk to me about her audition. She tells me the story and I can't help but think she's lying about it all. It all just seemed so bizarre, but I don't remember the details. I just remember that after the story, I told her about my day with her parents and she was very upset with me for spending time with them. She scolded me and asked what we had talked about over and over again for the rest of our trip. We went to sleep and left the next day. I remember feeling very weirded out with my friend after the trip. She seemed to be a lot more abrasive with me afterwards and adamant on me not speaking to her parents. Eventually, I learned that the name she had told me she had was actually not her legal name. Eventually, I saw that she had a high school diploma from 2019 and not 2018. I asked her about it and she said that she had got a misprint the misprint turned into her graduating late because she was in the mental hospital a lot. She went to mental health programs, but also traveled back and forth to England, but also went to school two days a week her senior year. She then said she did her senior year twice. She only lived in England when she was a child. She actually lived in England most of her life. Nothing was adding up. All of the stories she'd eventually tell never made sense together. I remember half-jokingly asking her to write a timeline of her life for me because things never added up. Still, despite all the inconsistency, I still kept her as a friend. The lies were just far apart from each other to feel like maybe I was the one who was wrong. The cognitive dissonance was growing in my mind, and this was just the beginning. Now, before I met my friend, I had begun practicing the Wiccan religion. I was a solitary Wiccan who lived by the reed, and you harm none, do what you will. I was actively practicing altruism as a form of devotion to the Wiccan moon goddess and horned god. My friend, coincidentally, was also a practicing Wiccan. We had done full moon rituals together, and she seemed to know a lot more than I did, so I usually followed her lead when it came to rituals. They started out tame. 
making a candle manifestation wish outside, sitting under the moonlight, meditating together. We'd make our wishes out loud, thus getting to know each other's deepest desires. We were very emotionally vulnerable in these moments together, and after our rituals, we'd try all kinds of divination and other spiritual practices. We were like our own little coven. One full moon, just before I had to leave, I asked my friend to do a tarot reading for me on my love life. I had just recently had a fight with my then boyfriend and wanted to know what she saw. My friend seemed to have all the answers about my life when it came to divination, and I was trusting of her enough to hear her out. She started pulling cards and read the descriptions. Every single card she pulled was a bad one. It said we'd end in failure, hardship, despair, that I had to leave him as soon as possible. I remember wanting to, but didn't know how. I left that night crying over how horrible that card reading went. To jump back in the timeline, after we started our second semester class, I remember opening up to some other classmate that my friend and I were witches. I did it in a way to offer spells for help, but my friend was mad at me for outing ourselves. She never wanted them knowing what we did. I was confused. I wanted to help others and invite them into our little world that I love so much. But my friends seemed to see it differently. So I respected her boundary and never brought up our practicing again to others outside of my personal life. Eventually, as I know you all have guessed, the pandemic started in March of 2020. Classes were moved to online and so was our friendship. We would FaceTime almost every day and watched movies while on call. Now, at my college, the musical was cast before the lockdown, and I unfortunately didn't get in, but my friend did. She met all the other theater majors and started talking to them in their Discord chat during the pandemic. I was never brought into that circle by her until the summer of 2020. And during that time, and even before lockdown, my friend would try to date the boys in the department and even grow an obsession with two of them. She had told the first one, who I am actually dating now, that she was friends with his favorite Broadway star and that she'd have them meet. He never believed her. After he turned her down, she became angry and started a rumor that he was actually gay. After that, she moved on to another guy who had a girlfriend at the time. She was even more obsessed with him. She enjoyed the chase. The fact that he was her friend and stayed up late and spoke to her all night made her so happy. He had opened up to me and said she was never the only one he spoke to and that he was just a night owl because of his job and she'd just be one of the only people up to talk to. During the course of two months during the lockdown and when people began to feel a little more comfortable, my friend and I had talked about her maybe moving into my house. Now, I have a large bedroom in my parents' basement, and my friend was beginning to scare me with her talks of how her parents were awful to her when she's home with just them. I also have yet to mention that she has an older brother with a form of autism among other issues, and she'd talk about how mean he was to her. She would constantly call me, saying that she was going to unalive herself. I was terrified and decided to open up my home to her. This was the worst but best mistake I ever made. Worse because of the escalation of our friendship getting worse, but best because it really had me realize how awful and manipulative she really was. She moved in and everything was great. It was nice to be with someone whom I considered my best friend. It was like a never ending sleepover. I had a spare bed in my room at the time and she used that for a while until she brought her mattress in and eventually moved almost all of her things in. Everything she had, however, reeked. Everything smelt like B.O., and when she lived there, she never showered. She'd stay here five days a week and two at her house. She refused to use our shower and never changed her clothes. She just sat on one side of my room and rot for days, only getting up to use the bathroom and pick up DoorDash. She'd eat on my side of the room and leave her mess for me to pick up. Eventually, I brought a large trash barrel for us to use, and she'd fill it up almost daily. I'd try to do moon rituals with her, and she'd refuse to practice with me. I'd ask for a tarot reading, and she'd refuse. However, the prophecies didn't stop. They just got worse. Instead of tarot readings, I'd get dream recalls. She'd tell me all these amazing dreams she'd have. They were said to be prophetic dreams brought to her by the goddess Aphrodite, whom she claimed to work with and worship while I was outside doing my moon rituals. She'd tell me I'd be a famous actress and I'd date K-pop stars. 
I'd see the world and be an amazing celebrity. Obviously, I didn't believe her at first, but she'd tell her stories in such a way that it gave me hope. Hope that my hard work would actually pay off. She had the guidance of Aphrodite on her side delivering her these messages. I wanted to believe her so bad that I shoved all logic aside to cling to the future reality she was feeding me. I was no longer in a sad and crumbling relationship. I would be cast in shows. I'd be happy one day. And that was truly all I wanted. Soon during the summer, my friend would have another friend over. We'd all hang out. But this new girl was more my friend's friend than mine. Eventually, however, my friend began to actively try to keep us from seeing each other. But it never really worked because eventually me and this other girl became close. We would even work out together in my room while my friend sulked in the corner, eyes closed listening to music, and ignoring us every time we invited her to join us. Also around that time, my friend had the boy she was obsessed with over. Now, this is not my story to tell. Despite the anonymity, I just don't feel comfortable sharing the exact details of this boy's encounter with my friend. But what happened was later told to me by this boy, and it was on a night that I was out at my then-boyfriend's house. This incident happened in my bedroom, however, and its details still haunt me to this day. Though, rest assured, nothing too horrible escalated. But if it weren't for some sort of intervening that I can't remember the details of, I don't know what my friend would have truly done to him. I remember after that night, despite not knowing what had happened, my friend grew even more malicious towards me. She began to sow the seeds of the fear of the Greek gods into me, saying they were angry with me. And that was why I was having bad days. That was why my boyfriend and I were always fighting. I was always doing things wrong. And it was driving me wild that I didn't know what it was exactly. All I knew was that I was upsetting the powers above me by just existing. And that was why my life was currently a mess. So one night, one desperate and hollow night, I asked my friend again about my future and what I was doing wrong. She looked to me and said, do you want it from me or Aphrodite? I looked to her and said Aphrodite. My friend enters a meditative state and then looks to me in an evil, sadistic way. Her demeanor had changed entirely. I have never seen and have yet to see anything quite like it. I was told that the reason I was having such horrible days was because I had to break up with my boyfriend. I had to do it soon or else nothing in my life would become true. No fame. No success, no happiness. If I didn't do it by the next full moon, that my life would be stagnant. That I'd amount to nothing. It was so convincing. I can still feel the primal fear that I felt right then and there. My friend took the bracelet I had been wearing, that was from my boyfriend, off of me and held it. She told me, still through the persona of Aphrodite, that I was being held down by this bracelet that in order to rid myself of my boyfriend once and for all, I had to get rid of it, soon. I was tasked to toss it in a lake an hour away from me, and do it only with my friend, but I had to break up with my boyfriend first before ridding myself of that cursed bracelet. I was stunned. I didn't know what to feel. My friend left the so-called trance and never recalled a thing. I told her about the encounter, how scared I was, the fear of being smited, of disobeying an ancient deity. She told me that I never had to do it. I think it was because she was scared of what she had done to me. Maybe she thought she went too far. Or maybe it was all just a part of the act to get me to do what she wanted. I'm not entirely sure. But I was adamant on leaving my then boyfriend. I had worked up the courage and did it a few days later. But everything still felt off. A few days after that, we drove with another friend of mine up to that lake. I invited that friend because I was scared to go just with my manipulative friend, and I remember her being angry with me for inviting this other girl, but I didn't care. I knew something was off and there needed to be more people, and I'm so glad for it, because I'm not sure what would have happened to me. We were entirely off the grid when we got there. The GPS stopped working 15 minutes before arriving at the lake, and we got lost trying to leave. It was truly a surreal experience and me and that other friend never felt fully safe that entire trip, and my evil friend was all too calm. After that, my friend moved out of my house. I remember we got into a fight. It was a night when she got mad at me for missing my ex. She had wanted me to cuddle her, and I wasn't comfortable with it, 
And so she went to her side of the room and sulked, waiting for me to beg her to come back. But I never did. We just went to sleep. The next day, I went to go speak to my ex about our breakup, finalize things, give things back, etc. I came home to my friend pretending to be asleep. She was laying in the dark, smiling. I told her to cut the crap and talk to me. I explained where I was, and she said she knew that my mom told her, which was actually true. We talked about how she's not getting better. She was cutting herself again. She wasn't eating. She was laying around all day. She made excuses when I tried to help her change her habits. I was worried, but every time I voiced my concern, I was met with excuses and blame for being concerned. So a few days later, she called me and told me that she'd never change and that I have to live with her the way that she was. At that time, she adopted having been diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and claimed to always have had it. I didn't believe her because she only started saying she had that after having watched a Netflix K-drama about a woman with the same diagnosis. I was finally starting to piece together all of the lies that she told me. I also found out a little before our fight that she was actually a year younger than me after having seen her ID. She explained that the reason that was was because her parents changed her birthday after she was adopted because they wanted a younger baby. She accused her parents of committing forgery. I wanted to take action, but she never did because it was a lie. Her chosen name was also a lie. She told me so many stories for the reason why she went by a different name after I found out her given name. Her accent was fake. She never lived in England. I believe she made that up after the trip she went on right before classes. I finally saw that everything was a lie. When she moved out, she left all of her things at my house. So my sister and I packed her stuff up and brought it to her house. She told me she wasn't home and couldn't help us. That she had to get adult diapers for her dying grandma, who was always dying. She also said that I wasn't allowed to bring her things inside and to leave it all in her mudroom. After we had packed everything into her mudroom, my friend walks out from her backyard, dressed in the fanciest outfit I've yet to see her in, and gets into the car with the boy that she was obsessed with, completely ignoring me and my sister. She never even said thank you. I was furious. I housed this girl. I cooked her meals if she never ate. I listened to her. I did everything in my power to care for her. And all I got was this massive F you and my life in shambles. I tried confronting her on her lie and was met with countless, inconsistent, and self-deprecative excuses. So I just gave up and never spoke to her again. She blocked me on everything after that and never spoke to anyone from my college ever again. She's gone from social media as well. All of her accounts were changed or deactivated. To conclude, I eventually got back together with that boyfriend and recently broke up with him on my own terms. I just wasn't ready to let go at the time. I still practice witchcraft, just not Wicca, and am much more educated now than I was three years ago. Like I said, I have a new boyfriend now, and I'm also best friends with the other girl who my evil friend introduced me to. I have my associate's degree in theater arts, and I've done a lot of work in one year for my local theater community. I plan to move to New York City this summer. My life is amazing now that I have that friend, among others, out of my life. I still, at times, blame myself for being so naive and so trusting. I blame myself for the hurt that I caused and how everything happened. I'm much more guarded now, but also a lot more headstrong. I also haven't made a new friend since, but I'm currently okay with that. There are many more lies she told me that I eventually figured out were lies, but that would just be too much to write. And honestly, I don't remember the timeline too clearly at some parts. But I wrote here, what I do know is right. I was stalked by a guest in my student accommodation. I'm 19 years old and living far from home in a studio room. I'm often up late and last week I was just doing some laundry at around 11 p.m. ish. I saw a man sitting in the lobby. I saw him around a bit at night but didn't think much of it. I'm in the laundry room. I just put my clothes in the dryer and I hear the laundry room door beeping. It meant someone was coming in. There was the man. 
standing there with no clothes to wash, just staring at me. I maneuvered around him and headed to the lifts. He followed me quickly and cornered me and asked for my Snapchat. I was tired and just wanted to get back to my room, so I stupidly gave it to him. I figured he'd message and try to flirt. I'd say, I have a boyfriend, sorry if you thought this was anything else, and that would be the end of it. Anyway, he starts messaging me. It's kind of normal. Then he starts saying weird stuff like, I saw you a month ago and I was impressed. I've been visiting a friend and staying here, and I've been watching you. I noticed that you mostly come out at night. He told me that he was only visiting for five more days. Then it gets worse. He says, I love you. I can't help it. And then I say, I have a boyfriend. He says, I only want you and continues to completely ignore that. He asks to come to my room and I said no. Then he wanted a hug. He asked me if I live alone and if I was a virgin. He kept saying he loved me and that I was perfect for him, that I impressed him. At that point, I recorded all the messages on Snapchat, spoke to him a little bit more to gather evidence so that I could take it to reception in the morning. He's been watching me for a month. I got my guy friend who lives on the second floor to walk me down to the laundry room. We sat in the student lounge area and my friend calmed me down. I was shaking with adrenaline and fear. We saw him around the laundry room again looking for me, but luckily I'd already picked it up. I run back to my room and my friend says that I can stay in his room. But I said, it's okay. I'll just lock my door. It's about 1 a.m. and I hear someone outside my room trying to get in. I asked my friend if he's outside my room and he just said no. So I froze. I didn't want to make a sound. I felt sick to my stomach and helpless. Eventually it stopped and whoever it was went away. In the morning, I reported this to reception and then went to stay a few days with my boyfriend. Then after I went to London to visit a friend. And last night was the first time I'd spent a night in my room since this happened. I'm very paranoid now. Sadly, I should probably be used to this. It's not the first time I've been harassed. But anyway, I'm terrified to go outside my room after dark, and I'm constantly looking over my shoulder and feeling paranoid. So I was on the way home from Arby's with a mint chocolate shake, zoned out for a sec and almost didn't notice his car. I tried just letting him through, but he insisted that I go on ahead. I didn't think much of it and just continued on walking. He drove on ahead and parked his car near some apartments. He had on a black polo shirt, so I assumed that he was just dropping something off for a job or something. As I kept walking, he approached me and offered me a $20 bill. I asked why, but couldn't understand what he said in response. I refused since I know what's best for me. However, that didn't deter him. He grabbed my waist and I stepped to the side. He then started pulling me towards his car. I bit his hand so he wouldn't silence me and made sure to scream as loud as possible to try and attract any bystanders if I could. He managed to get me into his car and just before he could close the door, I stuck my foot through the door to keep it open. I then got out and made myself go limp, since adding dead weight without warning creates sudden resistance and makes it harder for them to grasp you. Due to this quick thinking, I was able to get away unharmed. I quickly booked it and got on the phone with my mom once I was at a safe distance. I made sure to stay on the phone until I got back. After that, I had taken some time to calm down and waited for the cops to get there to get my statement. The officer ended up praising my quick thinking telling me that I'd luckily done everything right in this situation. Please, guys, take self-defense seriously. I've only ever had a week-long course, and just that alone had managed to save my life. I didn't remember too much from my self-defense course and only used the basic techniques that I'd remembered, which was making noise, dropping my weight, and checking behind me. Any other actions I'd taken were a result of logic and quick thinking. Chances are, if I'd gotten more self-defense training, it likely wouldn't have been as close of a call as it was. Also, never accept money from strangers. While there are good Samaritans, there's also people who don't have your best interest in mind. If you do think they have good intentions, make sure to double check by asking why they're offering you money. 
If you don't get a good legitimate reason, then make sure you refuse. If you refuse and they still persist, then get away immediately. I was around 9 or 10 years old when this happened, but I remember clearly pretty much everything that happened. So this was at school. It was lunch break, which lasted two hours. I was with a group of friends and we were playing like pretty much everyone else, but we started to notice people in front of the school. And when I mean people, I mean around 20. Usually there wasn't anyone, or they were just walking by. They had all their phones in their hands. A woman approached the entry of the school and she just started taking pictures of every kid that she saw. We could tell it by the flash. An adult of the school went to see her and told her to stop, but she didn't. Instead, she just smiled terrifyingly at him and said something that I didn't hear, but it looked kind of like when a mother comforts you in a, it's going to be okay way. So he started to get mad because, well, taking children and photos like that is super weird. Eventually she went away. But that didn't really change anything, if you want my opinion, because everyone else in front of the school was taking pictures of us. Literally everyone. I especially remember a guy that was pretending to call, except that he didn't talk, and he also had his flash on, so we quickly understood that he was also taking pictures. Us kids thought it was fun, and a sort of game, so we started playing hide-and-seek with them, being like, "Ah, oh, he flashed me, I'm gonna die, or stupid stuff like that but we really started to understand that there was a real problem when one of them tried to open the entry. That was kind of useless since the barriers weren't high enough. So if he wanted to get in, he could just climb it up a little. And that's when the headmaster got totally mad and went to see everyone, yelled at them for around 10 minutes, called the police. And when she calmed down, she asked to explain to someone why they were doing that. The headmaster told us herself that all these people pretended to be doing some sort of voodoo and that they could sell pictures of us, make us suffer, etc. To be honest, everyone mostly laughed, but the adults didn't seem amused at all. To this day, I don't know if what she said was true. I don't know if some people were arrested. I don't know what became of the pictures. The thing I remember the most is just that woman's smile that absolutely creeped me out. To this day, I'm scared of having my photo taken, even by friends. And when it's a family member or very close friends, I'm just really uncomfortable. Also, I apologize if my words are incorrect or if this story doesn't belong here. English isn't my native language, and I'm new to this sub, so sorry. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. And I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end of this video. Good night, everybody, and sleep well.